look in here. Can everybody hear me? Can you hear me? Can you see me? Sorry about being late. All clear. Good deal. There's a mic. There's a new mic. Let me know if it's too loud or if it doesn't sound good. Mess with the levels a little bit. It should be all right. BH, good to see you, buddy. Craig, good to see you, buddy. Based Hispanic, thinking about con thinking of converting to Islam. Are you talking about yourself or are you talking about me? <laughs> All right. Well, I hope everybody's day is going well. Sorry, I had to pick up my daughter from a further away vantage point. My mother-in-law, who was supposed to watch her today, wasn't able to watch her. Sounds okay to me, except we can hear your breathing. Okay. Let me see if I can put on a, a filter for that. Yeah, it doesn't have any filters on here. Hold on, noise suppression. Cool. There we go. That should help out a little bit. Sorry about that. I thought the pop filter would take care of that. I just set my daughter down and was running, trying to get ready for you guys. So a little out of breath. Okay, let's bring up the article. Probably the title is probably a little bit strange for some people. It could go either way. You don't know if it's like a Muslim slander or if it's a praise of Islam. You just don't know. Let's see here. Where can I... More out of breath than, than the blow burritos. <laughs> oh, too true, too true. Okay, let me see if I can add this. Hang on. Does that sound better? Some less of my breath, hopefully. I can add in video broadcast too, if need be. Window capture, I think. I don't have this all set up since I re-imaged my computer. Browser, display capture. I think we just want window capture. Oh. There we go. I would have been concerned if it incorporated Gates of Vienna in the title. Not Now, not so much. <laughs> oh. Okay, how did I edit the size of this thing? This thing is a little... Okay, we can do that. Is that gonna work on the side yet? Okay. And then, if there was a way for me to edit... Oh yeah, yeah, that's right. So I'm gonna go, okay, I'm gonna do transform. on the top, I'm gonna take off like 100, maybe like 50, there we go. Off the left, I wanna take like 50. Off of the right, and now I can shrink it down. There we go. Oh, that's actually a little bit of a weird size. Since why did I get so I guess I can put my screen over here and flip it. Uh transform flip horizontal. Ha <laughs> ha did it. Glad to see you, Wolf, today. How are you doing? I'm doing okay, Ibrahim. I'm doing okay. Happy to see everybody. Happy to be back, at least in whatever capacity this is. I'm gonna take off 100. Well, I'm sure some Jovi Austrian did not say that. <laughs> I got my new camera. Check this out, guys. 
got AI face tracking. So I'll never be out of frame. That's right. You'll never get away from me. Ha <laughs> ha. Okay. So this is just, this has been an article that I've kept very dear uh, to my heart. And it's shaped a lot of my opinions about things. And it's definitely shaping them quite a bit now. Right now. So, written uh, by Olavo de Carvalho. Super chats for Kadrov. Let's go. Let's go. The camera is much better, I noticed right away. Yeah, it is. It's a nicer camera, for sure. My other one was crap. Absolutely horrible. So, this is a nice gift for my uh, birthday from my wife. So, very kind, very thankful for that from her. But... I'm not sure if this is the date when it was actually written, but <laughs> Hazmat Gileyev did nothing wrong. Most likely correct. Most likely correct. <clears throat> so this is this article is all about what one of my favorite writers of all time thought about what the fate of the west would be and this article this author is a catholic he's a like a, a traditionalist catholic so he's kind of arguing against it in a way but it's very clear that Ganon, as well as a lot of people in his vein of thought the traditionalist and the perennialist perspective guys thought that there was no hope for salvation in the west anymore uh especially within the christian church and they thought that Islamization, and this will you'll see in the article, was the only option, the only way out, basically. Hail Abrahamism, bro. <laughs> Yo. <laughs> so you can see here it's got the got the uh, the prayer, the Islamic prayer going on there. But So basically, this first part of this, he's going on about how this United Religion Initiative initiated by an Episcopal Church bishop gained formal, informal support by Pope Francis and basically is just destroying, you know, the Western hegemony of religion, which the Western hegemony of religion would be a Christian framework, no doubt. Uh, there's little doubt in anybody with their salt, uh, worth their salt in the mind that you know, the West is... Spiritual foundations is uh, based on Christianity. That's just I'm not going to think of an undeniable reality. And um, so he goes and talks about analyzing, you know, these these books. But the main meat of it that I want to talk about is his is him talking about Rene Gagnon, Friedolf Schuon, and all of these traditionalist guys, and what he thought their position was. And how, what basically what his, what he thought, where he thought the West was going and how he critiques it. But I don't think that his critique is, I don't think his critique is, is enough. I think that, and he kind of says that at the end, that basically Ganon is an insurmountable intellect. He can't really, what he's, what he said has been so predictably true that anybody who's tried to make a counter argument has basically failed. And that's, I think that's true because anybody who's the, the, the perenniality of religious traditions and things like that, and Islam being the, the kind of final, the final revelation seems to be pretty apparent to him. So, mm, so it goes into Aldous Huxley and Alan Watts. Let me see here where I want to start here. Talks about Gurdjieff. Oh, here, here we go. I want to talk about where he talks about uh, exoterism and esotericism. <clears throat> so we'll start. I guess maybe we'll just start up here. Maybe we'll just start at the beginning. I feel there was a better starting point. I had it picked up, but it didn't say where I was at. Let's see. Haven't heard Watson years. Yeah. Well. 
it's probably for the best <laughs> every for the best for everybody's point of view or the best from everyone's vantage point right hmm <laughs> Alan Watts was pretty much a spiritual joke. Every true traditionalist has pretty much completely disagreed with his conclusions because it's basically just nihilism, just with a pretty bow on it, essentially, right? It was still just a man. <laughs> oh, yeah. A man who may have had a breakdown after his wife died and decades of occult Nick spookery. Who are you talking about? Are you talking about Watts or are you talking about Ganon? No, Sig isn't Craig. Craig is the stream that Jake built. Sorry for the confusion there. Here we go. Let's start here. This is it. From the point of view of the ordinary seeker who coming from the rev from revolutionary modernist and atheistic circles is alerted to the importance of spiritual themes and after a temporary illusion of the new age becomes disillusioned with its superficiality and goes on search of a more nourishing food the passage to traditionalism of Ganon and Shuan is a formidable intellectual upgrade an unculturating impact almost an inner transfiguration that will suddenly isolate him from the surrounding mental environment marked at one time by the discredit of religions and endless vulgarity of omnipresent occultism and will leave him alone face to face with his conscience. Thus is fulfilled on the individual scale the famous prophecy issued by an anonymous biographer of René Guénon soon after the master's death. The time will come when each one alone, deprived of all material contact that can help him in his inner resistance, will have to find himself and only in himself the means to adhere firmly through the center of his existence to the Lord of all truth. Rare, very rare, are those who reach this point. Most fall by the wayside. But for those who do, it is difficult to resist the impulse to make personal contact with Gainanian and Shuanian circles in search of relief, support, and guidance. It is by this process of spontaneous selection that the intellectual elite is formed, which, as we shall read on, Gainan uh, had in view of his 1924 book, East and West. Monsieur Gainan. Oh, gotcha. Okay. I would. I don't know about a. I mean, I don't know. I wouldn't know about a breakdown. I don't know if that is very encapsulating of what happened. But I mean, it, anything's possible. Um, For it is clear that among the various worldviews in struggle, the most comprehensive one, which absorbs and explains all the others, is at the top. It is the summit of the consciousness of an age, the neck plus ultra of intelligence and the intelligible. What gives even more authority to the perennialist teaching is the repeated affirmation by its expounders that it is not their invention, but the mere transfer in current theoretical language of uh, immemorial revelations that go back to a single original source, the primordial tradition. <clears throat> an, affirm an affirmation identical on the surface to that of the New Age proponents, but now based on a superabundance. Hey, Zico, I appreciate that, man. Beware the occult. You'll not only lose your mind, but your soul. Yeah, no doubt. New Age proponents, but now based on a superabundance of documented proofs, rational arguments, and an organized science of universal symbolism and comparatism, from which are born intellectually dazzling tours, dazzling tours de, tour de force, such as René Guénon's Symbol of Sacred Science, A Treasury of Traditional Wisdom by Whit Whittle and Perry, one of Frederick Schuon's col closest collaborators in the USA, Schuon in the U.S. Uh, in the USA, a monumental collection of sacred texts organized in such a way to illustrate beyond any reasonable doubt the essential convergence of the doctrines and symbols of the great religious and spiritual traditions, the transcendent unity of religions. As Shuan called, called it in the title of the book that none other than T.S. Eliot considered the greatest achievement of all times in the field of comparative religion. Happy to see you back, brother. I hope you're doing well. Thanks, man. I really appreciate that. I'm, I'm doing better. I'm doing better. I'm all right. Um, might just make it out of this whole dang thing alive, which is the most hope that I've had in about a year and a half's time. So I appreciate that. All the prayers are working. Um, in the first place, all the perennialists without exception insist that the doctrines, symbols, and rites of the various traditions in particular, although they always point to a, uh, although they always point to a supreme reality, which is the same in all cases have their own integrity and cannot be subject to fusion mixture or syncretism. In other words, they cannot undergo the kind of unifying operation that is precisely characterized by the new age. 
Secondly, not everything that presents itself under the name of religion, spirituality, or esotericism, or the like, can enter this synthesis. On the contrary, the precise, strict, and even intolerant uh, distinction between tradition, pseudo-tradition, and anti-tradition is common to all perennialists. Much of the material compacted in the New Age falls into these last two categories, and far from the, in the integrating and the unity of the primordial source represents the parody or negation of everything that comes from it. Third and most important, the transcendent unity of religions is really transcendent, not imminent. The religions that are unified only by the top, the summit, and the living core of their doctrinal conceptions, and not only the irreducible variety of their liturgies, their moral codes, and their different paths of spiritual realization. And where precisely is this core and summit? It is in their respective metaphysical conceptions, which are in fact co convergent as the simple collection organized by Whittle Perry suffices to show beyond all possibility of controversy. In this sense, religions and spiritual traditions can be seen without can be seen without distortion <clears throat> as adaptations of the same primordial truth to the historical, cultural, linguistic, and psychological conditions of the various times, places, and civilizations. The various exotericisms reflect in their difference in their differences the unity of the same primordial esotericism. Those who have clearly grasped the unity of this esotericism have intellectually overcome the difference between religions, but since they are not made of pure intellect and still have a historical temporal existence as flesh and blood people, they remain subordinated to their respective religious traditions without being able to merge or mix it with any other. The classic example is the great Sufi master uh, Ibn Arabi. I'm not going to say the first part because I'm bad. Uh, explicitly stating that his heart could assume all forms, that of a Hindu Brahmin, the, that of a Kabbalist rabbi, that of a Christian monk, or any other, he, or any other, he remained in his life a real and concrete individual entirely faithful to the strictest Islam, Islamic orthodoxy. Do traditionalism was and is to some extent a cult? They deny this, of course, but how does one, how does, how much does anyone here know of uh, Master Rene Ben Yaha's Nutty Miracles, his proto UNESCO view? I mean, yeah, it would be, I, but I mean, are you using like the traditional understanding of like cultists? This conception demands, besides the horizontal differentiation between the various traditions in, in time and space, a vertical or hierarchical distinction between the inferior and superior parts of each one. The lower or exoteric parts are historically conditioned, and by them the traditions move away from each other to the point of mutual hostility and total incompatibility. The higher esoteric parts reflect the unchanging eternity of truth, where all traditions converge and meet. Yeah, I mean, I think by the by the same definition, I mean, so you could turn almost anything into a cult, right? Like it becomes such a broad definition that it's like applicable to any religious tradition, period. There is, in short, a, a popular religion made up of rights and rules of conduct equal for all members of the community and an elite religion only for qualified people who, behind the symbols and laws, can grasp the ultimate meaning of revelation by practicing the aggregation rites that integrate them into the religious tradition and by obeying the rules the men of the people ob obtain the post-mortem salvation of their souls through initiation rites and members of the elite obtain in life and far beyond mere salvation. The spiritual realization... This, the, yeah, the spiritual realization that takes them away from the simple individual state of existence to transfigure them in the ultimate reality itself or God. Yeah. Example, the cultist per the Latin. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, agreed. I mean, it would, that's exactly what it would be. Not a cult in the, like the modern sense that's of the word where it's just like has a negative connotation. I mean... The cult uh, of cultists, yeah, it was a small. Sure, I mean, but it's the same thing, right? With anything, there are small cults of any religious faction, any religious tradition that exists, right? It's not good to talk much about these things before the general public, who may be scandalized by the decipherment of a mystery that must uh, remain opaque for their own spiritual protection. The story of the Sufi Mansur al halaj is well known, who after reaching the ultimate spiritual uh, realization came out shouting, uh, Ana al-Haq, I am the truth, and was beheaded by the exoteric authorities. Al-Haq does not uh, only mean the truth in the generic and abstract sense, it is one of the 99 names of God printed in the Quran, so that all uh, that al uh, halaj Lodge's statement is, was literally equivalent to I am God. 
From the point of view of the esoteric orthodoxy, this resulted in denying the chronic principle of the oneness of God and constituted a crime that was punished by death. Later Islamic jurists admitted that statements made by Sufis in a state of mystic rapture escaped the purview of ordinary justice and, and were to be accepted as undecipherable mysteries. In the explicit legal and official sense, the distinction between es exotericism and esotericism exists only in one tradition, Islam. It corresponds to the distinction between Sharia and Tariqa. Uh, <clears throat> on one side, the religious law obligatory for all. On the other, the spiritual way of free choice only for interested and gifted people. The application of this distinction to all other traditions is merely suggestive or analogical, a figure of speech, not a proper descriptive concept. With that, the whole edifice of perennialism begins to sway a bit. Well, the... I'll address. Yeah. Are there, for example, exoteris uh, exotericism and esotericism in the Hindu tradition? Precisely the one whose vocabulary Rene Gaynon uses most frequently because he thinks that Hinduism has uh, achieved maximum clarity in the exposition of metaphysical doctrine? Evidently not. The caste distinction is something completely different. First, because entry into the upper caste is not free choice. The subject is born Shudra, Vaishya, Vashiya, Kshatriya, or Bra Brahmana, and remains so and remains so forever. Second, because accidentally members of the lower castes can reach the highest levels of spiritual attainment without being without changing caste. Third, because there is nothing secret or discreet about the upper caste rites or Brahmana. Any Joe Schmo can know about them. He is just not allowed to practice them. Is there such a thing as Christian esotericism? Things get formidably complicated. There were and there are here and there esoteric organizations professing to be Christian, which by means of special rites, different, them, from, the, different from the sacraments of the church, transmit initiations. The companionship, uh, the Fideli di Amor, Freemasonry, and the Templar Order are examples. More modernly, numerous occultists such as Madame Blavatsky, Rudolf Steiner, and uh, Georges uh, Gurdjieff have presented their teachings as modalities of Christian esotericism. But there remain a few facts that are enough to demolish these claims. First of all, there is no trace of any Christian esoteric organization in the first 10 centuries of the church. Secondly, our Lord Jesus Christ himself stated flatly, I have taught nothing in secret. Even, in, even his parables, whose meanings uh, was not immediately evident to everyone, were spoken in public, not to a reserve circle. How is it possible then that the core of the Savior's teaching was kept secret for 10, 20 centuries? I would maybe disagree with that slightly because like the last supper was only with the apostles, right? Which is kind of like, that's the main sacramental mystery of, of the Christian, of the apostolic Christian churches. Uh, yeah. Rosicrucians would be another one, right? <clears throat> so that's a little bit, when he says that it makes me kind of squint a little bit. I mean, from a Catholic perspective, that's, I'm like the, the mass wasn't really the, you know, the chalice and the, I don't know. That wasn't really present in in for the open for everybody. That was just the apostles. Um, you know, eat, eat this. This is my body. Um, that whole entire uh, that entire event. In contrast, in Islam, <clears throat> the difference between exotericism and esotericism is clear from the very first moment. Upon seeing a group of the prophet's companions practicing certain strange rites, different from the five daily prayers, the faithful went to ask him what they were about. He explained that they were voluntary devotions, meritorious but not obligatory. This was the first sign of the existence of tasawwuf, or Sufism, Islamic esotericism. Literally, literally any night group? Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. No Zacrucians. <laughs> oh, here, can I do this? There, okay, hopefully that doesn't... Third and most decisive, the sacraments of the church are not mere rites of aggregation. They are initiatory in their own right. They give access not only to the community of the faithful or to their egregoria or collective consciousness, but Deo Juvante <clears throat> to the most intimate knowledge of the ultimate reality in which human beings can aspire. It is no longer I who exists as the apostle. It is Christ who exists in me. John Paul II, in his catechism, explicitly states that the sacraments are the steps of Christian initiation, and it is inconceivable that in such formally, uh, doc formally doctrinal text, 
he would use the term as a mere figure of speech. Father Juan Gonzalez Arantero, in two memorable books that, is prob that probably constitute the summit of mystical literature in the 20th century, demonstrates with abundant arguments and examples that the way of sacraments was open precisely to give everyone, without exception, access to the highest level of spiritual realization. The distinction between exoteric and esoteric is only used here as a metaphor to uh, designate the different spiritual benefit obtained by this or that individual according to his aptitudes, his commitment, and the movements of divine grace. <laughs> when you call Kutba, who are you talking about? <laughs> Defense of female circumcision? It's kind of a debased argument, right? Like, to just take it into such a fleshly realm seems kind of like low-hanging fruit, I would imagine, <laughs> to those that are, to those that have ears to hear. All Christians who have received the sacraments are therefore initiates in the strict sense that the perennialism gives to this word. <clears throat> the difference between the various spiritual results obtained can be explained by a concept devolved, uh, developed by René Guénon himself that the, of the virtual initiation. Not all initiation rites uh, immediately produce their corresponding spiritual results. These effects may remain withheld for a long time until some external factor or the evolution of the recipient itself called, calls them into full manifestation. To complicate things a little further, Shuan himself recognized, recognized that the Christian sacraments had initiatory scope. For one to appreciate how thorny this question is for the perennialist school, it is enough to recall that when Shuan's opinion on the subject was published, Gaynon's uh, reacted with indignation and fury, even breaking off relations with his disciple uh, and continuator. Gaynon <clears throat> continued to maintain that, Christ that the Christian sacraments were only rites of aggregation and that authentic initiations only existed in certain secret or discreet, or, or discreet organizations, such as the companionship or Freemasonry. To support this thesis, he invented one of the most artificial historical hypotheses anyone has ever seen. That, that Christianity initially emerged as an esotericism, but in view of the general decadence of the Greco-Roman religion, it was forced ex post facto to popularize itself, eventually being reduced to an exotericism. There is absolutely no sign of that ever happening. Quite the contrary. Jesus spoke openly to crowds from the very beginning of his preaching, and the sacraments have not gone uh, undergone any substantial changes in form or content over the ages. Whatever his errors may have been in other areas, on this point, Shuan was right. Master Ganon also agreed with Gurdjieff. Hmm. Now hold still while we activate the Kundalini Serpent. <laughs> it is only as a figure of speech that the distinction of exotericism and esotericism, or of aggregation of rights and initiatory rights, can apply to Judaism, since the Kabbalistic mystery cultists, there are none other than the very priests of the official cult. So, in a, so inappropriate is the application of this pair of concepts to extra-Islamic territory that members of the perennialist school itself have ended up having to acknowledge the existence of exo-esoteric or even exoteric initiations alongside the properly esoteric ones, which is enough to show that these concepts serve little purpose. Ganon's lack of reasonable arguments and his disproportionate reaction to what could have been a, a discussion amongst friends suggests that in this episode, he might have been hiding something. Unable to argue clearly, he appealed to an absurd hypothesis and tried to reduce the interlocutor, interlocutor to silence by a display of authority, which Shuan politely rejected. I think that this is an overstatement, but Freemasonry, another thing. Mehdi, what's up, man? Freemasonry, another thing from the Middle East. I think Ganon was just more attracted to esotericism of the Muslim world rather than so any so-called Islamic esotericism, which does not exist. <clears throat> What was the reason why Ganon would have chosen to forcibly fit all traditions into a pair into a pair of concepts that did not properly apply to any of them except Islam in particular? Why did this man, so judicious in everything else, allow himself such arbitrariness, thus putting himself in a vulnerable position that was jeopardized as soon as Shuan raised the question of sacramental initiations? He almost certainly had reasons for doing so, which, at least at this time, could not be openly discussed. But even before clarifying this point, another question needs to be raised. That material different traditions converge towards the same set of metaphysical principles is something that can no longer be seriously doubted. The thesis of transcendent unity of religions is victorious in every respect. 
So it's funny because like this author Carvalho, right? He comes kind of hard at Gaynon. He, he, you know, he's trying to argue against him in such a way, but then it it's like he 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 makes a, a counterpoint and then he has to back up. He has to you know backstep a little bit because I don't. That's why when he says certain things like this, I don't see a lot of evidence. I don't see a lot of evidence for these claims of 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 Gaynon overstepping his boundaries onto Shuan's hypo or over Shuan's claim about the the esoteric nature of the Christian religions or the that they're still um, esoterically binding or not, right? I think that, in my opinion, I believe that Gaynon knew exactly what was going to have happen to the Christian sacraments. I think it was more of a prophetic thing than it was uh, maybe at that time, but I think it they have been degraded over time. I think that's pretty clear um, via, pro, you know, uh, as far as the onslaught of Protestantism, post-Vatican II, um, orthodoxy kind of keeps somewhat of its initiation rights. But then you see this later. This is exactly what Carvalho argues, and he makes Gaynon's points very crystal clear. And that's kind of the whole point of why I wanted to read this, because when he succinctly puts Gaynon's points, in my opinion, it becomes very difficult to argue against them because I think they're very evidently clear with just a cursory reading of just of the culture at large of the world at large <clears throat> that that materially different religions converge toward the same set of metaphysical principles is something that can no longer be seriously doubted and once again <laughs> the thesis of transcendent unity of religions is victorious in every respect there is only one detail that what exactly is metaphysics i do not use the term uh, as the denomination of an academic discipline, but in the very special and precise sense that it has in the works of Gainon and Shuan. What is metaphysics? It is the structure of universal reality, which descends from the infinite and eternal first principle to its innumerable reflections in the manifested world through a series of levels or planes of existence. The fact that it is essentially the same in all traditions indicates that there is a normal perception of the basic structure of reality common to all men of any age or culture. This perception requires a clear consciousness, or at least a, pres uh, a presentiment of the scalarity of reality, that is, of the distinctions between different planes or levels of reality from the sensible objects of immediate perception to the ultimate reality. The absolute, eternal, immutable, and infinite principle passing through a series of inter uh, intermediate degrees, historical, terrestrial, cosmic, angelic, etc., the perfect submission of human subjectivity to this structure is implied in all traditions as a conditio sine qua non of religious life and even more so of spiritual realization. Its denial, mutilation, or alteration is the root of all the errors and follies of humanity. This is why Shuan proposes a distinction between essential heresy and accidental heresy. The word heresy comes from a Greek root that has the, meaning, has the meanings of to choose and to decide. The heresiarch is someone who, of his own volition, chooses from the total truth the parts that interest him and ignores the others. Accidental heresy, according to Shuan, is the denial, mutilation, or alteration of the canons of a particular tradition, such as monophysitism in Christianity, the theory that Jesus had only divine nature, not human nature, or associationism with Islam, associating God with other beings. Essential heresy is the denial, mutilation, or alter, uh, alteration of the very fabric of reality, an error, therefore, condemned not only by this or that particular tradition, but by all of them. Materialism or relativism would be an example of that, or for example. <clears throat> yeah. No joke. No joke. No joke, Jake. This is all very well, but there is a logical problem. If metaphysics is common to all traditions, how can it be the top and supreme perfection? Oh my gosh, my buddy's blowing my phone up. What the heck? <laughs> uh, if, yeah, if metaphysics is common to all traditions, how can it be the top and supreme perfection of each of them? By definition, the perfection of a species cannot be its genus. It has to be its specific difference. The perfection of the lion and the flea cannot reside in the simple fact that they are both animals. It is inadmissible that in the individual's initiatory climb, the arrival at the supreme reality, which raises him above the ind his individual state and absorbs him into the very being of divinity, is the culmination of his efforts. It would also correspond, according to perennialism, to the moment when the differences between spiritual traditions are definitively transcended. While continuing to apply to the empirical 
existence of the initiate on the eternal on the earthly plane. It is a Ibn Ar uh, it is Ibn Arabi being Christian, Zoroastrian, or Jewish inside, without ceasing to be orthodoxly Muslim outside. Yeah. Yeah, all the important people are in the house. Yeah, my daughter's asleep. My boys are on the chat in the chat. I'm putting the phone on silent. That's right. Let's do it. <laughs> That's right. Sayyid Kutba, major influence on the ideological formation of the neo Wahhabist Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. Not trolley, just busting some bubbles. I got you. Okay. <clears throat> But for this very reason, metaphysics can only be the culmination of traditions as such if we accept an in, in distinction between the order of being and the order of knowing, which according to Aristotle are inverses. The top of the initiation ladder cannot be at the same time the culmination of, of religions because being common to all of them it is only the genus to which they belong and not the supreme perfection specific to each one. More reasonable would be to suppose that the primordial tradition is the common basis, not only of all spiritual traditions, but of all cultures and ultimately of the core of sound, uh, of sound intelligence present in all human beings. Starting from this base or origin, the various traditions develop in different directions, each seeking to reflect or uh, more perfectly the absolute principle and to give men the means of returning to it. In this sense, the culmination of each tradition is not the principle itself, but the success it achieves in the operation of return. And there is no reason to suppose that, in the various species, all express equally well the perfection of the genus. Fleas and lions are equally animal, but the flea does not express the perfection of animality as well as the lion, to say nothing of the human being. <clears throat> Shuan asserts that the claim of each religion to be better than the others is only justifiable by the fact that they are all legitimate. That is, they reflect in their own way the primordial tradition. That is, that is, that, but that is, that seen on the scale of eternity and absolute, this claim is illusory. However, if the perfection of a species cannot reside in its genus alone, but rather in its uh, specific difference, there is no reason to take for granted that all species equally represent the perfection of the genus. All religions refer to a primordial tradition. Five, <clears throat> but do they all represent it equally well? The question is entirely legitimate, and nowhere has the perennialist school offered or tried to offer an acceptable answer to it. In fact, it is not even, it is not even asked the question. We will find even in these high places of the phenomenon of the ban on asking that Eric Vogelin discerned in mass ideologies. Folks here know about as much about the real flawed human personalities, which made up the core of traditional as the average Scientologist folks here, meaning like people in the chat, me, are you the, uh, are you the, the, the decipherer of all things traditionalism. You know, you've done the research. You put the nose to the grindstone and you've figured it all out. I don't know how much interaction we've even had. I don't really know. I don't really recognize you, but I've been gone for a long time. So the generation of the traditionalist school gathered around Friedhof Schuon, writes Charles Upton, presented the revealed religions <clears throat> in their celestial essences, subspecie eternatus. <clears throat> If the celestial essences of the religions are substantially the same, the difference between them is purely terrestrial and contingent. The particular forms of each having nothing sacred in themselves without the nourishment they receive from the primordial tradition. Only the one, the religio perennis, is the true in the strictest sense. The others are symbols or imperfect appearances of it, clothed in its various earthly incarnations. But, continues Upton, these revelations are considered branches of the primordial tradition. But this tradition is not presently in force as a religious system. It is not a religion that can be practiced. The only viable spiritual paths exist in the form of or within the present living revelations. Hinduism, Zoroastrianism, Buddhism, Jain, uh, Judaism, Christianity, I almost said Jainism, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. It's a strange, it's a strange level of like kind of character assassin, assassination arguments. I mean, yeah, if you're, if you're talking about like tantric wife swapping, yeah, I mean, that's, I don't know. I mean, 
it doesn't it make any sense to at least appeal that like to even call that spiritual cuckery is just it's just strange it's a strange position to hold like that it's it seems that it's like a post hoc analysis of an event that it's like i hold these ideals like cuckery to be the ultimate sins and i'm going to post hoc analysis everything through this kind of internet jargon uh pseudo worldview I mean, i'm not saying that it's even i don't I, I know i know about it and i'm not saying that it's not true but it just seems like a strange line strange line of argumentation i mean ananda korswami was was a hindu like what does that have to i don't understand like that's what i'm saying like what does it have to do with anything you know just because he was kind of uh, uh an aspect of a part of this group like one guy's you know weird tantric practices that are, are predominated in hinduism it is it's just a strange it's just strange i don't mean forgive me maybe i'm not maybe i'm too smooth brain but it just seems like a strange line of argument like it's like oh that crumbles their entire how does character assassination even in the first place crumble the arguments and the, the validity of these claims even if it was entirely true and every single person practiced that is the is the moral nature of the speaker does that determine the truth of their argument maybe to a degree probably but just seems like a so do you uh, do you have some type of like animosity towards these people because that's kind of what it reads like it seems more like an f these people they're wrong because they do things i don't like and don't agree with and because i've i've deemed them metaphysically improper or whatever i would like to know but these paths lead only because it was like you talked about uh female fgm then you're, now you're talking about wife swapping this <laughs> is this is these constant, in my opinion, kind of low hanging character assassination arguments, you know, not dealing with any of the things that they're saying. It's just like, Oh, they influenced Wahhabism. Oh, they, there's, there's uh connections to FGM. One of them had wife swapping. It seems to be like yeah, a, a de evolution of the argument into just like, internet gossip kind of a thing that's so common in the Twitter sphere and stuff like that. <clears throat> hey, Yusuf, how you doing, buddy? Are you saying are you saying Evola had claimed that? Like are you are you saying Evola had a had a had a dog in the fight? It, are you or are you I mean do you hold Evola in high regard? I'm I'm having it, having difficulty discerning your meaning between your quips. But these paths leave only to salvation in a post-mortem life. To climb a little higher in the present life, one must, without abandoning them, join an esoteric organization and practice, besides the rites and commandments of the popular, popular religion, some special rites and commandments of initiatory character. In other words, popular religion is a certificate for qual of qualification required of the postulant <clears throat> at the entrance to the initiation path. For the Muslim, this is not a big problem. Although they have a separate existence, tariqas are generally recognized as legitimate by the official religion so that the interested believer can move freely between the two types of practices. For the Hindu, this is not a problem either. Even though there is no proper Hindu esotericism, Hinduism accepts and absorbs all the practices of other religions so that, apart from uh, the political conflicts between Hindus and Muslims, nothing prevents a Hindu from joining a tariqa, Freemasonry, a Chinese triad, or any other esoteric organization without changing his status in his society of origin. In the case of a Catholic, however, things get complicated. According to Gainon, all Christian initiation organizations disappeared after the Middle Ages, leaving the poor faithful limited to a spiritually capricious exotericism. All that remained were the remnants of extinct organizations and Freemasonry. It turns out that a sentence of Pope Clement the Se the the twelfth in 1738 condemned an to automatic excommunication any faithful Catholic who affiliated with Freemasonry or any other secret society. The decision was reinforced by Pope Leo X in 1890 and formalized by the 1917 Code of Canon Law. 
The new code of Pope John Paul II in 1983 spoke only of secret societies, without mentioning Freemasonry by name, which briefly gave the impression that the excommunication had been suspended, until the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith in November of the same year clarified that this was not the case at all, that the prohibition to join Freemasonry remained in force. In other words, the faithful Catholic who read René Guénon and believed in him, seeing in the loss of the initiatory dimension of the roots of all evils of the modern world, was pressed to the wall by the, by the choice between giving up esotericism once and for all, being content with exotericism more and more, reduced to an external moralism, or seeking Masonic initiation and, him, and being excommunicated. That is, losing the exoteric affiliation, which, according to Guénon himself, was the conditio sine qua non uh, for, uh, for entering esotericism. The conflict was not only of a legal order, although I had remote origins in professedly Christian esoteric organizations, Freemasonry had become, in various parts of the world, an ostensibly and violent anti-Catholic force, encouraging persecutions and killings of Catholics, especially in France during the Revolution, and then again in the early 20th century in Mexico, where this provoked the, Christer the uh, Cristero War system, yeah, and in Spain, where the barely disguised uh, convents of the Masonic Republican government, priests and faithful, were killed in large numbers, and many churches destroyed even before the Civil War broke out. That is to say, the Catholic who affiliated with Freemasonry not only incurred automatic excommunication, but he became a traitor to his murdered co-religionists. Catholic Guanonians like Jean Turniac went to great lengths to prove that Masonic doctrines were compatible with Catholicism, but of course this remained theoretical. Talks between Catholic and Masonic leaders in search of an agreement came to nothing. Excommunication was still in force, and the moral hazards was still very high. Beginning in 1960s, uh, when these problems began to become the subject of more open discussion in the circles of those interested in traditionalism, the perennialist group began to suggest to the trapped Catholic the following possible solutions. Well, yeah, I would agree. Ego death doesn't make you immortal. That's a fact. Yeah, I mean, that's not the entire end goal of any uh, of any of the claims that are being addressed in this article or elsewhere. I have these men's words and actions. These are my only evidence. Again, I may be the bad guy here, but scrutinize for yourself. No, that's fine, man. That's that's totally fine. But I agree. Ego death isn't the end goal. I don't think that was that was gay. I don't, I don't, even, I don't even imagine that was gay nuns or Martin Ling's or any of the traditionalists point at all. I don't think ego death was the ultimate end goal for anybody. Like to if you're thinking that like total extinction into oneness is the was the primary goal and and that and that correlates to ego death. Yeah. Now you don't need to be you can categorize yourself as a bad guy, man. I appreciate you being here. So it's interesting. I mean, you're raising, you're raising interesting points. It's just sometimes a little bit hard to follow your line of thought. So I apologize if I'm not doing it correctly. Forgive me for that. So here's kind of where it gets to the meat, to the nitty gritty, the nitty gritty that we've been talking about that I wanted to read this article for you guys. So beginning in the 1960s, and for those who don't know, 1960s is when the second Vatican council became codified. Um, and Gaynon's predictions about what was going to happen to the Catholic Church when he uh, was friends with that French humanist. I can never remember his name. Maybe Sig will remember. But that uh, a Catholic, a French Catholic humanist that had a lot of influence within the papacy at that time, he saw like the seeds of liberalism and its inability to return to a true metaphysic was going to blossom into the Second Vatican Council. My cousin was into this stuff for a decades. He's not well anymore. And this anti new, anti new age, new age stuff was at least a small part. Oh, he's not well anymore. So what would you say the, I mean, what's your, what's your position on all this? Like what religious tradition would you imagine that is the, as the gate outward, you know, like what, what offers relief, what offers sanctuary from modernity and stuff like that? <laughs> your line of language more like damn Americans can't properly parlay well we're we're you know we're we're mutts man like what do, what do you expect like 
we're, I don't think we're made to do that. We're not from the lofty areas of, la of uh, lofty lands of linguistics and things like that. You know, unfortunately not blessed in that way. Mm. No high, uh, high tradition or anything like that to appeal to or education to fall back on. We're all just scraping the bottom of the barrel trying to make it out alive. You know what I mean? Beginning in the 1960s, these problems began to become the subject of more open discussions in the circles of those interested in traditionalism. The perennialist group began to suggest to the trapped Catholic the following possible solutions. Drop everything and convert to Islam. Seek shelter in the Russian Orthodox Church, where there is still a residue of esotericism and whose sacraments, after all, are accepted as valid by the Catholic Church. Join the multi-faith Tariqa of Shuruan, where you can practice Islamic initiation rites without formal conversion and while keeping at a prudent distance from exoteric Muslims. The first option was certainly the most traumatic. After all, Shuan himself had written that changing religion is not like changing country. It is like changing planets. It is like changing the planet. Yeah. The second was more comfortable, but it ran into an obstacle that I've never seen any perennialist author even mention. The Russian Orthodox Church was infested with KGB agents, and it was almost impossible for the newcomer to find his way through, the sa through that savage jungle of conspiracies and pretenses. Not coincidentally, the KGB was at the very moment organizing and training Islamic terrorist organizations for war against the Christian West. What esoteric residues of the Russian Orthodox Church have? Mm, they have just, a, I would say that they have a, a higher view of the sacraments and they keep hold to the Desert Fathers. And they read the Church Fathers more frequently. Their uh, entire liturgy is more traditional. It's not watered down and they defend it more rigorously, particularly the Russians, but not not normally the Greeks or the, uh, the Coptics or the um, Antiochians or anything like that. Yeah, it could be wrong due to entheogen use. Yeah, I'm not maybe disagreeing with that. I'm saying these folks weren't saints. Well, who do you believe? So do you believe there are any saints in any, you know, in any religious tradition? And can, I don't know if, I don't, and I just don't know if the grappling uh, with these, with these claims is it can be invalidated based on the historical record and based on the world that we see now. That's the, that's the question. But if you imagine that there's some type of outlet or some type of, how would I say some type of spiritual stream that can be latched on outside of just, you know, materialism and things like that. I mean, are you like, you know, are you, are you like a Platonist or something like that? And you believe in like the, something like that, something that looks like the Western hermetic tradition or something. And your Neo or Neo Platonism. Cause I mean, you clearly don't believe in any of the real revealed religions, you know, right. Definitely not part of any of the Semitic faiths as, as you probably categorize them. So, <clears throat> uh, the, the left, uh, that left the third, the easiest and most natural. Shuan's Tarika was in fact full of members of Catholic origin, starting with Shuan himself and some of his closest collaborators, such as Martin Lings, Titus Burkhard and, uh, Rama P. Koraswamy of whom the first two converted to Islam, the third remained a Catholic, at least in public, while still paying uh, the sheikh uh, the statutory vow of total obedience required in the Tariqas. Orthodoxy, Slavic Christianity wants to pretend it is or always was more Greek than Jewish. So this, so I, I guess that would be your point. So you would agree that the Judaic roots of all three of the revealed religions would be too much for any, for it was too much to overcome and must, they must be cast away because of that. And you must revert to some type of, um, some type of pre-Christian paganism or something of that nature. Is that, would, would that be your argument? You're correct in that I do not. Nobody owns God or truth. Yeah. I mean, you're right about that. In the souls of those who remain Catholics, Catholics ex professo, or in heart only, the plan that Rene Gainon had been outlining for the entire West since 1924 was thus being realized on a microscopic scale. 
After describing with the somber colors of a genuine apocalypse, the spiritual degradations of the civilizations in the West, attributing to it the loss of the true metaphysics and the links between the Catholic Church and the primordial tradition, links that could only have been maintained through initiatory organizations, René Guénon foresaw three possible developments for the state of the affairs of the West. One is the definitive fall into barbarism. Two, the restoration of Catholic tradition under the discreet guidance of Islamic spiritual masters. Or three, total Islamization, either through infiltration and propaganda or through military occupation. I will own nothing and be happy. I will eat the bugs and I will get in the pod. I won't. I, I won't. But, <laughs> but I was just echoing the sentiment. <laughs> That's what I'm asking, though. It's like, how? What's the what's the hope of any person to survive the modern hellhole? I'll eat the tide buds and live with the bugs. <laughs> like, what's the hope for any modern person to escape this? Like, with any traditional framework that's accessible, somewhat that's accessible to them. You know, what hope does anybody have? Is if there just is none? Is there no hope for them? These three options were basically reduced to two: either a plunge into barbarism or submission to Islam either discreetly or ostentatiously. The outbreak of World War II seemed to show that the West preferred the first option, and it is an ironic detail that important Islamic religious authorities gave the Fuhrer their full support, especially on the question of the extermination of the Jews. Macabre coincidence or self-fulfilling prophecy, I don't know. <laughs> kind of a interest, kind of a, probably an overstepping of the truth there too, but whatever. Become a barbarian, wage war against modern society, throw a rock at big brain. <laughs> After the war, the close collaboration between Islamic governments and communist regimes in the joint anti-West effort became, uh, came to be so notorious that there is no need to dwell on this point. It is also worth remembering that today, the world left, which is committed to corrupting the West until it sinks, as Andre Breton advocated, is the same one that ostensibly supports the Muslim occupation of the West through mass immigration, as well as boycotting by all means any serious effort to combat Islamic terrorism, so that there is between the two blocks a kind of Leninist agreement to foster corruption and denounce it. <clears throat> Again, the same question from the previous paragraph applies with the same answer. For the aspirant from a Catholic background, all the Tariqa offered was the choice between becoming a Muslim or being a Catholic under Muslim guidance. The same choice that Gaynon was offering to the entire Western world. Argument is everything has been subtly distorted, polluted, or too easily to too easy to use for perversely human purposes. We'll only know if we are saved after the delusion of the corporal modality, i.e. death. So there is no hope. It's just basically you die and you find out <laughs> what's the, what's the phrase fuck around and find out. <laughs> That's basically it. <laughs> you know, what a way to live <laughs> that we have, that we have the ability to do. What a way to live. I believe that this makes Gaynon's intention to squeeze all religions, especially the Christian one into the forced mold of an Islamic descriptive concept. The exoterism, the exoterism, esoterism, distinction clearer. Indeed, how can one dominate an entire civilization without first framing it within the intellectual coordinate system of the dominating civilization, where it will cease to be an autonomous totality to become part of a comprehensive map? It is also obvious that it was not enough to do this in theory. The most valuable, most intellectually active elements of the target civilization elite had to be won over to this new view of things. Only, only when the latter became, began to understand themselves in the dominator's terms instead of their own would, would they be ripe to accept. Without further reaction, a wider operation of cultural occupation, all the more so because the reduction of Christianity to the binomial exotericism, exotericism and esotericism, accompanied by the gloomy diagnosis of the loss of the esoteric dimension, inexorably culminated in the conclusion that the restoration of Christianity, of its connections with the primordial tradition, and therefore of the higher dimensions of its spirituality, could only take place under the direction of a living esotericism, and that is Sufism. To use Genon's own terms, it was necessary to submit the West to the spiritual authority of Islam before submitting it to the temporal power. 
He needs some milk. Demi status is the last stand of implicit whiteness. And this too shall pass. <laughs> Demi dude is the last. <laughs> oh man. Homosexuality is the last stand of implicit whiteness to, to quote, to, uh, to quote Spencer, Fuhrer Spencer. <laughs> I don't want, uh, I'll, I want to have my gay bath houses as long as there's no colored people in it. What was that other one that floated around for a while there? That was a funny one. I don't know if that's, uh, I, yeah. I don't know if that's really Evola's flavor, man. I think that's, I just don't know. He was in pretty large agreement with the majority of the rest of the traditionalists. Took a little bit of a different, a little bit of a different stand on certain things, but I don't know. There's a lot of evidence that he was initiated into the same Sufi organizations that they were. It seems like a pretty big gamble on the soul. And I don't necessarily know if it was something that he was at, he was really advocating for ultimately. Maybe, but I could definitely be wrong. Shuan's theory that the Christian sacraments retained their initiatory power seemed to mitigate how uh, somewhat the force of the Islamis, the is Islamizing argument, but in fact it did not do so at all. Without the proper spiritual instruction, which only a living esotericism could offer him, the bearer of a virtual initiation remained unaware of having, of having received it, and not only remained paralyzed in the middle of the initiation climb, but risked as a result suffering all sorts of spiritual and psychic disturbances. Only Sufi spirituality embodied in this case, in the person of Shuan, could save Catholics from themselves. Nah, heck no techno. <laughs> yeah. I mean, did you, have you read the book, uh, written from one of his close confidants? I, he was, I believe he was either Orthodox or Catholic who said that he was in fact a Sufi. I've read it. It's been a long time since I've read it, but. The Islamization of the West, discreet or overt, Peaceful or violent is the central and indeed the only objective of Rene Guénon's entire work. The entire work converges on this goal not as a mere logical conclusion, but as a way of on, as a kind of only way out to which the reader and ideally the entire West is being led within the walls of a labyrinthine construction by a sense of inexor uh, inexorable fatality. Apart from this objective, his work is nothing more than a collection of purposeless theoretical speculations, an edifice of beautiful and unrealizable spiritual possibilities, which he always denied. If an explicit confession were necessary to confirm this, it would suffice to recall that at the very moment when Shuan was returning from Algeria with the title of Sheikh, vaunting his intention to Islamicize Europe, Gainon declared that the foundation of Shuan's Tarika in Lausanne, in Lausanne, Switzerland, was the first and only fruit produced by this decades-long effort. Yeah, and I mean, to say that active, an active nihilism, like, I, I guess you have to you have to buy into the fact that, you know, that the vast majority of people will be utterly incapable of practicing something like that. You know, so it will t truly be the, only the spiritual elites, the aristocrats of the soul that will be able to be participant in something like that. Everybody has to ride the tiger. Right? Not every, and not everybody will, not nor not everybody can. It's funny that he's got this... <laughs> he's got this uh, article by Archbishop Vigano. That guy has really gone off the rails. Poor, poor guy. <clears throat> he's too bought up in the too caught up in the whole QAnon thing pretty cringe to be honest what makes this goal nebulous or even invisible to the public eye are two factors first Ganon repeatedly affirmed his total contempt for any political activity current or ideology assuring that his interests had nothing to do with the struggle for power 
and has turned exclusively to the sphere of the spiritual and the eternal. This seems to place him, in the eyes of many, incomparably above the current dispute between Islamic countries in the West. This way of seeing is not exactly false, it is just empty. It is obvious that Ganon is not disputing political power. He is disputing something that is infinitely above it, and of which, as he himself explains, political power is only a secondary, almost negligible reflection. He is disputing spiritual authority. He is disputing with the Catholic. He is dis, he is disputing with the Catholic Church, placing himself far above it and claiming to guide it from a sublime heights of Sufi spirituality. Not necessarily in person, of course. We used to call it the minimalist lifestyle, growing up poor. As an East Montana hill folk poor, not accelerationist welfare poor. <laughs> accelerationist welfare poor. That's a new one. That's a new one for me. I like that. You think that Evola was really advocating for a minimalist lifestyle in that regard? I don't know. I almost thought you, I almost thought that you were like implying like a Bapian, a Bapian nihilism, and I was like, please don't do that to anybody including yourself don't buy into that guy talk about a fall from grace that that man that that uh kutba <laughs> dealt with Jeez, that was pretty pretty nuts he's very explicit on this point the catholic church at some point in its history he says has lost contact with the primordial tradition and no longer even has an understanding of the higher parts of metaphysics. It stops at pure ontology or theory of being without penetrating the supreme mysteries of non-being. Shuan prefers to say supra-being. I've already explained on other occasions what seems to me to be the intrinsic absurdity of the doctrine of non-being. I will not return to this subject here. What matters for the moment is to point out that, according to Guénon, Catholicism from its, this initial mutilation came to sh decline sharply until it was reduced to a mere sentimental devotion for the masses. Since only those who can raise it from the, this abyss are the ones who still possess the original connection with primordial tradition, it is evident from the salvation uh, that the salvation of the church and through her of the entire West can only come from outside. From where precisely? Not from Buddhism, since Gainon does not even consider it a fully valid tradition. Nor because he, he sees it as like a watered down Hinduism. It was a, a rebellion, an active rebellion against the caste system and stuff like that, which Khoroswami definitely argued with him about. But nor from Hinduism, because it cannot be practiced outside of India, nor by anyone who is not of Indian nationality. All that Hinduism can provide is a deeper understanding of metaphysical doctrine. And indeed, Gainon resorts abundantly to Hindu texts for this, but mere theoretical understanding, while indispensable, cannot by itself even remotely provide authentic metaphysical realization. Of Judaism, even less so, for it would be inconceivable that the church, having been born of it, would return to its mother's womb without ipso facto annulling itself and ceasing to exist. <laughs> yeah. So that's the, that's the, I guess that's the argument is empiricism is the only thing that's left. I mean, how do you determine what is meaningful? Like, how do you determine what is good, what is moral, what is meaningful under that, under that worldview work? Can you at all? I mean, since it's active nihilism, probably not, right? Like, do you have any ability to tell people that homosexuality is immoral or something like that? Of Judaism, even less so, for it would be inconceivable that the church, having been born of it, would return into its mother's womb without ipso facto annulling itself and ceasing to exist. From free Freemasonry? Impossible. Not only because of its incompatibilities pointed out above and never overcome, but because, according to Gainon, Masonic initiations are only the, of small mysteries, secrets of the cosmos and society that do not even remotely touch the heights of the supreme metaphysical realization, the great mysteries. From obstacle to obstacle, there is no need to examine all the alternatives. The, inaccept the uh, inexorable conclusion is that the labyrinth of impossibilities has only one way out. Catholicism can only be returned to its original integrity if it consents to submit itself to the guidance of Islamic masters. Either that or the occupation of the West by Muslims. Tertium non datur.
that in passant, Ganon and his followers made several valuable contributions, even to the understanding of Catholic of Catholicism by Catholic intellectuals themselves, especially with regard to symbolism and sacred art, is something that no one in his right mind could deny. Well said. But there again, that is nothing to be surprised about. What authority could a Sufi master claim to exercise over Catholics if, at least on some select points, he did not prove to understand their religion better than they did themselves? Ganon's Catholic articles published in Re Regnabit <clears throat> between 1925 and 1927 do not prove or even suggest that he accepted the independence, much less the superiority of Catholicism over Islam. They only proved that at the at that period he still believed in the possibility of directing the course of things in the Catholic Church by means of gentle persuasion and infiltration. This is an interesting point that he thinks that he he wasn't still Catholic at this point, which I would probably disagree with. <laughs> oh boy. His departure for, for Egypt in 1930 with the firm decision not to return and to communicate with his public henceforth only through the journal uh, Etudes Traditionelles, Traditionelles, I don't know how to say, I don't know how to pronounce French, marked the moment when he lost his this hope and integrating himself more and more and more into Egyptian esoteric circles, even marrying the daughter of the prestigious Sheikh Elish El Kabir. Passed the ball back to the Islamic authorities, who had by far guided his actions in the European framework. How things evolved from that point to the adoption of the policy of terrorism and occupation by immigration, which of course would have never happened without the blessing of Islamic spiritual authorities, is a story that we do not know and that can only be told perhaps several decades from now. What is absolutely certain is that Ganon, from the very beginning of his public activity, declared that he did not speak in his own name, but strictly followed the guidance of qualified representatives of the Oriental traditions, among whom it is now known was mainly Sheikh Al-Kabir himself. It is utter nonsense to say that Ganon converted to Islam in 1930. He had been a regular member of a tariqa at least since he was 21, which is enough to show that he had been long prepared for the very difficult mission he was about to undertake. Tends to work for you as an organism. Do you have a family? So it would be an interesting answer, I'm sure. The second factor that makes it difficult to perceive Ganon's identity as an Islamic agent is the very impact of his work on his, dis on his disciples. Qualified as the most dazzling intellectual miracle of our time, this work sheds so many unforeseen lights on the religious phenomenon and the spiritual decadence of the West, and so great is its contrast with all modern atheistic or Christian thought that the temptation to regard it really as a miracle, a divine intervention in the course of history, becomes almost irresistible. <laughs> almost irresistible that's accurate that's how it feels when you just give get on a cursory read like i said it feels like you're reading prophecy have no progeny hmm. do you plan on it are you a young man are you an old man you speak like a young man not weathered <laughs> like me <laughs> Viewed in this way, Gaynon's work, oh, excuse me, right. Mm, Say Syed Hossein Nas in Knowledge and the Sacred does not hesitate to present the entire intellectual history of the West as if it were a long, groping, half hearted pre preparation for the advent of Gaynonian lights. Viewed in this way, Gaynon's work seemed like a supra historical message coming from the dawn of time from the primordial tradition itself and not from a contemporary Adi Egyptian sheikh. The desire to erase <laughs> the 20 year old thoughts, <laughs> old, old man, just made the live. Can I get a 20 second summary of an article of the article? <laughs> yeah, I'll go. We're about to finish and I'll, I'll go up and I'll show you the article, <laughs> the point of the article. <laughs> 
I can't breed. <laughs> That's funny. St. George of the Jungle. Wow, I love that. That's fantastic. <laughs> You're reading it? Yeah, I am reading it. We're just, I mean, I didn't read all of it. Somewhat all of it, though. The desire to erase his contemporary roots and to hover above historical contingencies is manifest in several passages of this work and is further reinforced by several expressions of the contempt for the mere historical perspective. According to Guénon, an illusory veil of passing appearances covering up the reality of eternal things. He even criticizes the attachment of the Western mentality to facts as if it were a vice of thought. Jane Robin characteristically proclaims Guénonism as providential intervention and the last chance for the West. It is an inalienable right of the enthusiastic disciple to celebrate this, uh, the master's work with the most emphatic qualifiers. But a qualifier means nothing when separated from the substance it qualifies. It is one thing to speak generically of a last chance for the West, and we all know that the West needs one. But it is quite another to make it clear that this is not just any chance, an abstract or generic restoration of spirituality, but rather salvation through Islamization. Jane Robbins simply omits that point, or this point, whatever. It is also very fair to privilege the eternal and immutable above the temporal and transitory. But any faithful Catholic accustomed to the sacrament of confession understands that the leap of the, to the eternal without passing through awareness of the factual details of earthly life, so often humiliating and depressing, is not spirituality, it is angelism. The apostle who affirms, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me, is the same one who confesses to carrying a thorn in the flesh to the end of his days. I'll answer that in a second, Ibrahim. Ibrahim. The desire to fly into the world of eternal archetypes by leaping over concrete historical reality appears not only in the hagiographic profiles of René Guénon's mission, but in at least three books by important perennialist authors on Islam. Ideals and Realities of Islam by Syed Hossein Nasser, Comprender uh, El, El Islam <laughs> by Shuan and Moorish culture in Spain by Titus Burkhart barely conceal their historical strategy of showing Muslim life only in the eternal archetypes that it symbolizes, contrasting them explicitly or implicitly with the gross factual miseries of the materialistic West. It is all even a little naive. Even a child realizes that it is not fair to compare the virtues of one with the defects of another, instead of virtues with virtues and defects with defects. All this makes it difficult, both for the newcomer, the newcomer reader and sometimes for the spokesmen of perennialism themselves, to admit the obvious. The work of René Guénon can have all the providential and salvific character one wants, on the condition that one clearly admits the obvious. That is... That, in the end, it has never offered any other way of salvation for the West except Islamization. It is also true that any intelligent Christian, Catholic or otherwise, can benefit from the teachings of René Guénon without adhering to the Guénonian project. But how can one refuse adherence without knowing or wanting to know what the pro that the project exists? Every useful idiot is an idiot, and useful to the same extent that he denies the existence of the one who uses it. Many Christians, Catholic or not, have been so outraged by the teachings of René Guénon that they have made several attempts to refute and even deride him. This is my, it's probably my favorite, like, little double sentence, two sentences in the whole article. These attempts only approved, <laughs> only proved the intellectual superiority of the opponent and fell into ridicule or oblivion. <laughs> In this respect, Gainon's disciples were not entirely wrong in considering him unsurpassable, the infallible compass, Michael Valsam said. But Gainon need neither be fought nor defeated. By adopting the pseudonym Sphinx in his early writings, he knew that those who did not decipher his message would be swallowed up and reduced to obedience. Those who lurch <clears throat> between cries of revolt will not fail to render him obedience begrudgingly or even unconsciously. Once deciphered, however, the Sphinx not, has no remedy but to gently release its prey, which will emerge from its clutches, not only free, but strengthened. 
1947 to 2022 is when Corvallo died. Summary of the article can be summarized in these two points. From the Christian perspective on the esoteric point, on, from the Christian, from the perspective of gain on the Christian and anybody in the West has these options. This is the point of the article. Drop everything and convert to Islam. Seek shelter in the Russian Orthodox Church where there's still a residue of esotericism and whose sacraments, after all, are accepted as valid by the Catholic Church. Join the multi-faith tariqa of Shuan. This is obviously historically not there anymore, but where you can practice Islamic initiation rites without formal conversion while keeping at a prudent distance from ex distance from exoteric Muslims, and that the West only has these options. The definitive fall into barbarism, the restoration of Catholic tradition under the discreet guidance of Islamic spiritual masters, or total Islamization, either through infiltration and propaganda or through military mm -hmm. occupation. But that, those are the futures for the West according to the man who basically who has predicted everything up until this point almost 100% correctly of course sig would <laughs> i choose option 3 option 3 here or option 3 here which one do you mean <laughs> just kidding but So that's it, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. I'm back. I'm alive. Oh, to Ibrahim. By the way, Wolf, if you don't mind me asking, you told me you were going to get retested to get diagnosed. Did, did you do? Yes, I did do. I did do. I did do do that. Uh, I had another EMG. From an from a neurologist with 22 years of experience and four years of on-site training in in a neuromuscular clinic, and they found no anomalies in my EMG on the 19th of this month. None. So that's the status right now. All symptoms remain, but according to all observable metrics, not dying, at least in any accelerated method or an accelerated way uh, that is observable to doctors, <laughs> at least as of right now. So what's your takeaway from this article? Uh... I have a very hard time, and it's probably just because I'm no longer as smart of a man as I used to be, but <laughs> these books that are on here. <laughs> Jeez. Um, my takeaway is, is that it's always very hard to deny Gainon's positions. And this one, this article just clearly outlines them, outlines them for those who are reading his books and things like that and didn't really understand what the entire point was. This is saying that the point was to Islamicize the West. <laughs> Tucker's like, <"Bruh." laughs> right? So I found I found Gainon correct in almost every regard, uh, and it is very hard for me to just say now that this portrayal of what he is saying is wrong. I always hope you all the best, Wolf. Thanks, Ibrahim. I appreciate that, man. Seems like everything that Gainon predicted has come true in the majority of ways. <clears throat> and every, I mean, the fact that people did flock, I mean, it's happened. Everything like what he just said happened. The Catholic church fell into kind of sympathetic, sentimental devotionism, the exact critique that Evola had for Christianity. It fell into that after the second Vatican council, the religion itself 
is very strained. You've got a Pope that's supporting global homo, a borderline. Some say that he's not. Some say that he is. You got people like Ed Fazer, which are the most fantastic philosophers in Catholic thought, basically saying that the papacy is in a retracted state, which is impossible, which invalidates the claims of the papacy, that it will maintain itself until the end of time. You had people leaving the Catholic Church because of its modernizing efforts and its liberalism into Russian Orthodoxy and the Orthodox Church. All of that is happening. And then you have Islam that is coming into the West and people are converting in droves. In droves. Of multi -le of multi levels, not everybody's becoming like high mystics, but you have people converting to exoteric Islam, Salafism, Wahhabism, all over the place. Pope John Paul II kissing the Quran. And it's like how you see all of that happening in real in in the real world, talking about this in these empirical senses that Sig is talking about, and and just go us. Ah, the guy's wrong. The guy's, he's damaged by, you know, acid, right? What is a man to do? Which way, Western man? Fight like hell to maintain the traditions that you think that you, that you think you can defend, you think that you can maintain? Hmm? What do you do? Do you do this? Is this possible? And does and what does that mean? Does that doesn't that mean that this is better than this? Wouldn't that inherently imply that? Isn't this happening? So why don't you just do this? That's the argument. Because this failed. This isn't possible anymore. This is a failure because of exactly what he's, he outlines here. And there's more to it than this. There's more to it than just the KGB. This guy's obviously focused on communism to a kind of a ridiculous degree, but uh, Carvalho is and thinks it's a lot worse. He thinks it's a lot worse than really that it is, but the problems with the Russian Orthodox Church are not just there. The lack of a coherent authority and stuff like that, and it's it's having its own issues. Petty nationalism. I'm not saying that nationalism is inherently petty. I'm saying it has petty nationalism. The Russian Orthodox Church does. And it goes to war with other Orthodox churches just for the sake of no, just for the sake of nothing. I side with Russia entirely on the on the war in Ukraine. By the way, that's not what I'm saying. I'm not disliking Russia. I love Russia, but you know, I would I would contend with moving there. But you know, but this is not an option for any serious seeker. So that's the point. That's the question. And can you do it? Can you make it happen? Don't know, man. For what it's worth, my for my own empirical analysis, there's a huge increase in converts into li into Islam. Liberalism and rainbow people aided in that. Yeah, like they accelerated it, and you have massive conversions of right wing nationalists into Islam. I think it has more to do with the countries. Well, if Christian minorities who live there have their faith as serious as Muslims. I agree. There are pockets of true Christian belief. That's, there's no doubt in that. There are. They're very small, in my opinion, and in my experience. Even it being a part of both orthodoxy, being into Russian Orthodox churches, and then becoming Catholic after that. I've ex experienced all ends of that. The sincerity of belief in the West for Christendom is at a... is at a, uh, a crisis point level of low. And it has devolved just into sentimental devotion.
just as Nietzsche said, just as Evola says, just as Ganon said. So I think you're right, Abraham, and you're doing them great justice, and I thank you for that. It's a very kind thing to say about them. You're very generous. Thank you. So, I don't know. It's just something to ponder. Just something to think about. I read I read this article. I come back to it every, every few months and I reread it. Because <laughs> I think it's so pressing. So, just wanted to get it out there so you guys could climb around on it and think about it. Give me feedback. <laughs> but my wife is home now, boys. My daughter may be waking up from her nap. So I'm going to leave you with that. I'm going to leave you with that question. guess take it easy. Do you think Islam is a bigger threat to Christianity than liberalism? Absolutely not. Islam is absolutely not a bigger threat to Christianity than, liber than liberalism is. Liberalism is the ultimate threat of all religions and all everything currently. Secular liberalism, secular humanism, materialism are the most pressing current ideologies to be dealt with. They are the epistemic root of everything that is wrong in the world. Scientific atheism, enlightenment rationalism, it's a scourge upon the earth and it should be routed out with violence. Excuse me, in Minecraft. But it should be routed out. It has to be. In order to save the souls of many, it has to be routed out. How's my Quran reading though, Wolf? It's just fine. Let's say that. <laughs> it's just fine. And I thank you for asking me. I think liberalism is the biggest threat. You agree? Good. Are you a Christian yourself? Don't mind. Maybe I maybe you're somebody I already know. Or are you a Muslim? I don't know. And it's hilarious. It's a funny thing that when liberalism and modernism seeped into every single other religion, and this is a, this is an interesting note, every other religion softened, became and crumbled under the weight of li philosophical liberalism and modernism. Islam became more violent and became more strict, like in this case of Salafism and Wahhabism. It's a very interesting thing to notice that that is the modernism of the modern reaction in Islam to liberalism and and and, mo and the movements of modernism. It didn't soften; it became harsher. <laughs> and what does that say about the strength of its position? I don't know. <laughs> why is every other? Why did every other religion, Buddhism, Hinduism? Christianity, Judaism, become secularly human, secular humanist, weak, mamby-pamby. Why did they all become like that? And Islam was the only one that became a, 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 a furious vindicator against it. I don't know. <laughs> I, it's the kind of questions that keep me up at night. Could it be because it is the young one? Maybe it is 600 years, the younger of the, uh, of, and more, you know, than the, the second youngest faith in, in question. The Freemasonry also became very, I'm trying to use YouTube appropriate language, <laughs> became very, mm, 
pathetic. <laughs> There's a G word that I want to use very <laughs> right now, but I'm not. I'm not going to. Um, it could be. Maybe that's. Maybe it, it. It's because of its its length of time that's been around. Christianity had been around 600 years longer, ish. That's a loose estimate. But but you know, Buddhism a lot longer than that. But it. But that's the thing is. Buddhism didn't have this issue. It still maintained the strength of its traditions until it encountered this. So you would imagine if it was just a time lapsing issue, that would have changed uh, just due to the nature of time itself. I think it's about what, how you react to it, your encounter with liberalism. Time could be a factor, but I don't think it's the only factor, right? Global homo is just so strong. <laughs> Indeed it is. Indeed it is. So. Anyways. Uh, whoever wants invite into the Discord, of course that's still there. It's still open for all to join. Um, if not, you know, leave comments. I'll, of course, try to address them. I care about all you guys. I missed you guys. I missed everybody. I'm really happy to do a stream, to have a new mic, to have a new camera. Let me see if it still does it with my face. Hold on. No. Oh, yeah, there it goes. It, like, zooms in when I, like... You could use, you could use that for, like, funny reactions. You're like, what? It just zooms in. <laughs> I can set the level in which it crops my face to set the zoom level and stuff. This is just, I thought the best one, the, the default best one. Where I can find the link wolf to this article. You can play with this all day. I can. Oh, and it's cool. And so it's AI, right? So I can just turn it off. I just like hold my hand up and you can turn it off. So that it doesn't follow you anymore. It's fun. I know the, di Oh, the discord. Let me put a link. Let me put a link. Bam. And since live replay won't exist after the stream ends, nobody can join except for the initiated few. <laughs> Nobody can join but the initiated few. So feel free to run around and post in there and stuff like that. It's a free space. As much as the Discord admins <laughs> will allow us to be, right, until they shut it down. So... I appreciate you guys. Love you guys. Until next time, I'll try to think of a, another interesting topic to go over that we can all investigate together. In the meantime, keep praying for me. Keep praying for my health. Hey, man, BH, I hope you enjoyed it. I know it's weird. I know it's strange, but I hope you get at least gleaned something out of it. Something useful. You guys take it easy, all right? I'll see you guys next time.